So Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you in the name of Jesus for this awesome, awesome day. Thank you for the privilege of being here today, Lord. I thank you for all these wonderful people. Yeah, these people that you just love so much, Lord. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. All right. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And just kind of reviewing some of the stuff we went through last week. So the word salvation is sotoria, which is the welfare, prosperity, deliverance, pr preservation, salvation, and safety. That's what that word means. It's an all-encompassing word. And it's Paul saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it brings welfare, prosperity, deliverance, preservation, salvation, and safety to everyone who believes. Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. Again, this word is the Greek word sozo, and it is healing, deliverance, salvation, welfare, preservation, prosperity. All those things rolled into this one word. Mark 5.28 this is the woman with the issue of blood who goes up and she touches Jesus and she is healed. And she's, she's thinking to herself and she says, if I just, just touch his clothes, I will be healed. This is the same word. This is the word sozo. It's the same word. We've, we've taken the gospel and we've separated these things out. This is the same. The same, the same grace that brings you your eternal salvation is the same grace that can bring healing to your body. It's the same grace that can, bring, that can bring deliverance to your mind. It's the same grace that can bring welfare to your state of economic being. It's not, and when I say welfare, I'm not talking the government welfare. I'm talking the God welfare, the, the welfare, the state of abundance that he wants you to be in. It's all accessing his grace by our faith, by simply putting our faith in what Jesus has done for us. And that's what Jesus wants. He wants you to live in overwhelming victory in every area of your life overwhelming victory because he has provided victory for you and it's the faith that we have and what he has already done for us what he has already accomplished for us for everyone in this room for the entire world as a matter of fact and all we have to do is believe what he's already done it's, it's by grace but it's by simply trusting by putting our faith in him now we have to realize that Romans 8, 37, know in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. That is the message we have to carry into this world. We're more than conquerors. We're more than victorious. He's given us, in his name, overwhelming victory. Because we have this new covenant. We need to change the way we think because we live under a new covenant with Jesus. When we, when we entered into this new covenant, it wasn't about what we did, it was about what he did. It was about what he did. And when we, when we think about this new covenant, we need to change the way we, we need to change, we need to change what we're thinking about here. We need to change the way we, we speak. We need to make powerful confessions with our mouth. We need to say, you know what, 1 Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes I'm healed. So if you feel sickness coming onto your body, you don't say, man, this, man, my allergies are really acting up. Oh, my arthritis is really kicking in today. You know what, that's not yours. Send it back to the pit where it belongs. That's not your stuff. That's not your stuff. The God, didn't, God didn't send you arthritis. God didn't send you a cold. God didn't send cancer to your family. That's not, that's not from God. That's not yours. Don't take possession of it. Identify whose problem it is. It is from the devil, and then give it back to him. Say, you know what? This is not from God. I don't receive this in my body. I don't receive this. Jesus has given me overwhelming victory. First Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes, I'm going to get healed? No, it says, by his stripes, you were healed. You were healed. Now it's up to us to just step in by the same faith we received our eternal salvation and say, you know what? Jesus did it. Jesus already did it. And I'm going to believe it and I'm going to receive it. We need to change the way we think. We need to change the way we pray in the new covenant. This is really important. We need to change the way we pray. If we're, if we're still pr pr praying like old covenant prayers, God can't answer those. You know, if we're, if we're praying to God, you know, please don't take your spirit from me, Lord. Give me a clean heart. He can't answer that prayer because he already did. 
Like if you're a believer and you're praying that, that's a great prayer for David to pray because he didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The anointing came on him. But the anointing, the anointing will come on you too. But you also have the indwelling of the Spirit of God. You have the indwelling of the Spirit of God. When we pray under the new covenant, you know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, if we think it under the old covenant, we might get a little confused and we might think that all of our circumstances are God's will. That's not what this verse is saying. It's God saying, it's my will for you to give thanks in all circumstances, to rejoice always. So what does that mean? Does that mean if we get a bad report from the doctor, we say, oh, Jesus, thank you for this bad report. Woo! Woo! No. We say, oh, Jesus, thank you for giving me victory. I know your word is higher than this bad report. I know you, by, by your stripes I am healed. And then we stand on that. We stand on our victory. We stand on our victory. We have to understand what has already been provided for us. And under the new covenant, we don't have to wonder what the will of God is because Jesus has already made it abundantly clear in our lives. I mean, there's some, like, what is his personal plan? Does he want you to become a doctor? Does he want you to travel to Spain? You know what? You pray about that, okay? Does he want you to be healed? Amen. Yes, he does. Does he want you, does he want you, to, does he want you to, to, to prosper in all things as your soul prospers? Amen. Yes, he does. Is, has he provided victory for, the, for, for you in all areas of your life? Yes, he has. That's God's will. That's God's will. We, we no longer have to wonder for those things when we pray. We can decree and declare what his will is already for us. We get to step into his will and we get to pray with power and authority because he has given us power and authority. We don't have to wonder if we have power and authority because he has given us power and authority. When we entered into this new covenant, this covenant is between the Father, Father God, and Jesus. We enter into this covenant based on faith. Now, it's like the covenant with this room, with this spot in this strip mall, is between me, because I signed it, and the landlord. You walked into here based on your faith. You didn't sign the covenant. I signed the covenant. It's with me and the landlord. You're here because you had faith that, well, doors are going to be unlocked. I'm going to show up. That's the covenant that we have with Jesus. We just got to put our faith in it. It's between the Father and Jesus. It doesn't, it's not based on our performance. It's based on what he has done. When the, when the sinner brought the sin offering into the temple under the old covenant, he brought it in. Let's just say, let's just say this is, let's just say this is my, my sin offering here. Well, can you come up here? I want you to be the... Actually, you know, I'll be the priest. I get to be the priest. Okay, so you bring me your sin offering. The priest receives the sin offering. He doesn't look at the person bringing the offering. He says, oh. He inspects the, he inspects the sacrifice, and he says, okay, this is, this, is the, this is the type of sacrifice we need. Now, under the new covenant... Our sin offering is Jesus, all right? Our, Jesus, Jesus is the high priest. Jesus, when you come to Jesus, he doesn't look at you and say, oh, you know what? No, you're not quite up to standard. I can't receive your offering. Your offering is Jesus, okay? Jesus, I oh, thank you. Jesus is the offering. Jesus is the offering. It's his righteousness. It, this is how we have right standing. Jesus is the priest, he is the mediator, and he is the offering. So in his name, when we pray in this new covenant, we have power and authority. I wouldn't pray in the name of Noah. In the name of Noah, I speak to sickness and disease. No, I pray in the name of Jesus because he has power and authority and he has given it to me. He has given me delegated power and authority. When, when I turned on the light switch this morning and the lights came on, it's because the power company sent me the power. I didn't create the power. I had the delegated authority to turn on the light switch. If I called up the power company and said, hey, my lights aren't on, they'd probably say, did you, did you try a switch? i say, no, man. You supply the power. they say, right. You got delegated authority. Turn on your lights. 
And that's the same thing with this new covenant. We've got delegated authority from God to turn on the lights. We've got delegated authority from God to pray in the name of Jesus, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out devils, and to declare the favorable year of the Lord. We get to declare the Lord's favor over our lives and over the lives of the people around us. This is the delegated authority Jesus has given us to walk in. In the name of Jesus, we have this this authority, not just for us, but for the ones around us. Have you ever been on an airplane? You ever ride on a, a commercial airplane when they say, hey, in case of emergency, fasten your mask before you try to help somebody else? <laughs> we got to claim this for ourselves sometimes before we can try to help somebody else. You know, when, when, when we start to acknowledge to ourselves, like Philemon 1.6 says, every good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus the, the, the power of our witness becomes effective because when we start to give thanks in all circumstances, not, not thank, God for, thank God for cancer, but thank God for the victory over cancer, thank God for the victory over poverty, thank God for the victory over, over depression, people look at us and are like, man, you are, you're happy. You're going through hell, but you're happy. You know what? Because I got power over hell <laughs> in the name of Jesus. I got victory over hell in the name of Jesus. He's already conquered sin and death. Jesus has already conquered hell. So it doesn't matter what the devil's throwing at me today because I've already won by what Jesus has done 2,000 years ago. And then when we adopt that mindset and we begin to believe what Christ has already done in us and for us, then all of a sudden he can do it through us. And we start to manifest this victory in our lives. And even when we just first start to acknowledge this victory, when we first start to acknowledge it with an attitude of thankfulness, in gratefulness and a victorious mindset, people around us recognize that and they start to pay attention to what you're saying. Because I remember the days when I was in the bar and I was not doing well with my life and I had people trying to share Jesus with me that were just as much a loser as I was. It was very ineffective. It was very ineffective. You're telling me to go to church, I know you're going to be more hungover than me in the morning and you're not going to be there either. Why are you wasting your time? What are you doing? Like, I, I remember, I was like, oh, dude, you're, making, <laughs> you're making Jesus look bad right now, buddy. Just shut up, you know? I mean, it's like when you got that bumper sticker on your, on your car and you're like, Jesus is Savior, and you're flipping people off in traffic. That's just really bad advertising. People aren't going to, people aren't going to be like, man, I want to be like that angry bird, you know? <laughs> no. You're like, wow, this is really bad advertising for the kingdom. I don't put bumper stickers on my car for anything because sometimes I'm, not, I don't flip people off, but I mean, sometimes I just, you know, just bad driving, man. It just kind of happens. You know, I'm on purpose, but it just kind of happens. So just like with this airplane, just like with this airplane, you got to fasten your mask. you got to fasten that oxygen because that's your source, okay? The, if you're trying to help other people and you're not hooked up to that oxygen, guess what? <laughs> you're not going to be helping anybody for very long because you're going to run out of air. You're going to pass out and you might die. All right. If you're trying to help other people and you're not hooked up to your source, guess what's going to happen? You're going to run out and you might die. You need to be firmly attached to your source. You need to be firmly connected to your source. And that's Jesus. That's Jesus Christ. That's, the, that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You need to be firmly rooted in him. And you remember, when you are rooted in him, Holiness is a fruit of your relationship with God. It's not the root of your relationship with God. Thank you very much, Jesus. Because if I root myself in him, if I root myself in his word, and if I root myself in his spirit, I begin to manifest the fruits of the spirit. I begin to manifest holiness. I don't work for my holiness like I did under the old covenant. I receive my right standing with Christ through faith. And when I start to believe this change that has taken inside of me, taken place, I start to manifest it. It's awesome and amazing, but that's what we get to do in prayer. We just have to believe what Jesus has already said for us to do and just step into that and step into the power and the authority that he's given us. When we transform, we transform ourselves, we transform our thinking, we transform the world around us, starting with ourselves and our family, by renewing our mind to God's word and his will. And you know what happens according to Romans 12 too? We prove the perfect will of God when we do that. How do you prove the perfect will of God? By transforming your mind to what his word says. By transforming your mind to his reality. By praying 
into his reality by praying what his word says. Ephesians 6, chapter 8, verse 18, or Ephesians 6, 18. Uh, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert always and keep praying for all the Lord's people. So we got to pray in line with the new covenant. We got to pray in line. We got to acknowledge what Jesus is doing in us. And we actually, one, one part I notice that when people start to, when believers start to kind of get this revelation of grace and the finished works of the cross, and man, Jesus already did that. Healing's already done. He's already provided for this. He's already provided for my deliverance. Sometimes we start to think, well, if it's already done, then yay, <laughs> I can sit back. I can kind of. I can kind of take it easy, right? No. You need to stand. You need to stand in your authority. You need to, it, Scripture clearly tells us over and over and over again that we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to pray. We're supposed, when? All the time. We pray all the time. We pray all the time. I love this passage because it says pray in the Spirit. Wow, that's awesome. We're going to be talking a little bit more about praying in the Spirit next week. But when we pray in the Spirit, and, you know, I don't know if everybody here is familiar with the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. We're going to spend some more time on that next week. But when we pray in the Spirit, we, we get to speak in this unknown tongue. We get to, we get to pray. You know, we don't know what we're saying. We're praying the mysteries of God. We're praying. We're praying revelation. We're praying in power. We're praying in authority for things we don't even know about. You know what? That's awesome because we can't disagree with it. We can't doubt what we don't. Well, uh, I love praying in the Spirit when I don't know what's going on, which is pretty much all the time. You know, I love praying in the Spirit because I can't, I can't argue with myself. I can't argue with God's. So I'm like, oh, I'm praying in the Spirit. You know, nothing happens without somebody praying. Healing, miracles, nothing happens without somebody praying. And I've talked to so many people that are like, you know, I had this miracle happen to me, but nobody prayed for me. Oh, really? Oh, really? I don't know who I'm praying for when I'm praying for the Spirit. I don't know who I'm praying for when I'm praying in the Spirit. I could be praying for somebody in China that I've never met and that I will never meet. And I'm praying for that miracle to happen. I'm giving God, I'm giving his power a door. We're like doors. We're like this, we're, we're, we're a channel from heaven to earth. We speak with our mouth. Our mouth is like this key that opens up this door. We open up the door to bring the power of God into this present age. He has given us this, he has designated us, he's given us this power and authority to release his will. That's why Jesus said, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have to release that. We have to release that word for the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray in agreement with his will, things happen. When we pray in the spirit, we get to pray for all kinds of things to happen that we don't know about. We're, sometimes we're praying for ourselves. Sometimes we're praying for somebody we don't know. Sometimes we're praying for our family. We might be thinking one thing, like, God, I really need, man, I, I really need to get that. I, I, I got this headache, Lord. I just wish this headache would go away. And God knows there's something more than a headache going on there. And you're praying in the Spirit, and he's like, I'm going to fix that right now before you even have to go to the doctor. Boom. Oh, thank you, Jesus. My headache went away. I just prayed in the Spirit. My headache went away. He's like, yeah, I took care of more than that. I took care of more than that for you. Because miracles are happening all the time for God's people. All the time for God's people. And when we pray in the Spirit, we, we can't, we have no room to argue. We have no room to doubt. But backing it up, listen, we're talking about praying, praying in our known language. We can't be doubting what God's will is. And the devil couldn't stop you from getting saved. You know why? Because he doesn't have any power. He had power, but Jesus took it away from him when he rose from the dead. Okay? He had power because he took it away from Adam because Adam gave it up. The devil had power. He was the prince of the power of this world. But you know what? He's not anymore. He's defeated. We can call him that if we want to, but we can just call him devil with a little D too because he's, he's just a little D devil. I don't, you don't even capitalize that D because he's, 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 the only power he has is the lie. And if he can get you to believe lies, he can, imp he can disempower you. He couldn't get you to believe the lie that you didn't need a Savior, so you got saved, you got born again. But if he can get you to believe the lie that, oh, man, that didn't include, that didn't include anything else. It's just, you just got your glory ticket punched for eternity. Man, you put that in your pocket, you're going to need it when you die. Don't lose it. Don't lose your glory ticket. 
Because when the bus driver shows up, he's going to need to see it. And if you lost your salvation, you're not going to get on the bus. No, you're on the bus, okay? You're already on the bus. Your ticket's been punched, okay? And it includes more than just the ride to glory in the sweet by and by. God has given us victory in this present age. If the devil can get you to believe the lie that your, your healing, your deliverance, your prosperity, that was not included in the cross. That's an extra add-on. And you can't afford it right now. <laughs> that, that's, the part that depends, that's the part that depends on your, on your ability to be holy. Really, I thought my righteousness was in Christ. I thought, I thought he became sin so I could become his righteousness. Well, I guess that's what the Word says, right? If we spend time reading the Word, reading it through the lens of the New Covenant, we won't be believing all this stupid stuff the devil is selling us. And he sells it to us so subtly that we just... Oh, well, I heard, I heard that in a hymn I sang one time. <laughs> what? What? Oh, I heard a pastor preaching about Job. Yeah, was this 100 AD or was this last week? Because we got Job figured out. Even Job got Job figured out when he apologized at the end of the book saying, Lord, forgive me, I didn't even know what I was talking about. And Jesus came to perfectly reveal the will of the Father. First, the first chapter of Hebrews says Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. Not a partial, not a kinda. It said everything before Jesus was a type and a shadow. Jesus is the fullness of the Father. Fullness. Fullness. Doesn't mean, if you, that what does it, fullness means if you see it in Jesus, you get to see it in the Father. And if you didn't see it in Jesus, you don't get to see it in the Father. That's the exact representation, okay? But somehow, we get confused, and we, we start to give God credit for bad things. We get confused, and we start to give credit for bad things. Jesus didn't do anything bad. He never laid hands on anybody and made them sick. You, I don't recall that passage of Scripture, all right? I, I mean, Jesus laid hands on him and Gave them, gave them devils. You know what I mean? I don't, there's, there's four main lies. Okay? There's, there's four big lies the devil is going to try to get you to believe so, to, to make you ineffective as a believer. He wants to make the gospel ineffective in your life and in others. Salvation is just about getting saved. We cover that. Uh, you've got you've, your grace. Grace is what got you saved. So if he can't keep you get, from getting saved, you know, he'll say, okay, 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 okay. Okay, religion comes along and says, okay, hey, hey, hey. Grace, yeah, yeah, you got saved by grace, but everything else is up to you. Everything else is up to you. You want to get healed, you need to pray harder. You want to do, you, you, you got to, man, it's, it's, and then you know what? When we start to think, our, keep, even keeping our salvation is up to us, we go from the new covenant to the old covenant. We put ourselves under self-righteousness. We stepped out from Christ's righteousness. We put ourselves under self-righteousness. We put ourselves under the law, and we bring the power of sin to life. Because that's what the law does. That's what, self, that's what self-justification does. And we become less and less and less effective for God. Because he doesn't, it, it, he considers the teachings of Christ-based righteousness is the most elementary teaching in the New Testament. The, is Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 5. Is the, you, you still don't understand, you know, if you re- read in the last part of Hebrews, says, he's saying, you guys don't get this teaching about righteousness yet. Like, this is baby stuff. Like, you guys, want, you guys want all this deep intellectual scripture teaching. You don't understand. You're the righteousness of Christ. Like, we can't go on from here until you get this down. And then the next thing he says at the end of the chapter is you need to learn how to distinguish. And by the way, we're, we're going through Hebrews as a church, so if you're not on it, we read Hebrews chapter 5 and go into Hebrews chapter 6 for this coming week. And he says, you guys need to understand the difference between good and evil. <laughs> this is like baby stuff here. Baby, and we can laugh about it, but how many times have we given God credit for something the devil has done? We hear, we hear of a natural disaster, and we're like, oh, man, God's really judging those people. He's taking out his wrath. Well, he's judging New Orleans. He's taking his wrath. You know what? If God's judging New Orleans, he better apologize for judging Jesus, because I thought Jesus took it all. Really? That's, that is unscriptural. That is not the way the new covenant works. God's not pouring his wrath out on people. He poured it out on Jesus. Now, we've given, the, Jesus said, I am the door. John 10, he says, I am the door. 
not John 10, 9. I am the door. If anyone enters me, he will be saved and will find good pasture. In John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come to give life. So if it's stealing, killing, or destroying, we say, you know what? That's not Jesus. That's not God. That's the thief. <laughs> okay. And he doesn't have any power over me because I'm under the new covenant. I get to take authority in the name of Jesus. Man, this is so awesome. Okay? So, Jesus came, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He's, he's, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Do you know that Jesus is still here doing the same thing? His mission never changed. He is still here to do these things, except instead of being limited in his physical earthly body, he put himself into your physical earthly body. He has multiplied himself through you. You want to know what you're supposed to do? Well, the Spirit of the Lord is in you because he has anointed you to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent you to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Christ in you, Christ in me, the hope of glory, is still the same mission. It's still the same mission. It hasn't changed. He's multiplied himself over and over and over again. Each time one of us gets born again and the new creation comes, the old man passes away, the spirit of the living God comes inside of you to heal the sick, to raise the dead, and to cast out devils. Matthew 10, 8. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. He didn't say, ask the father. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. He didn't say, ask me because he's given us designated power and authority in his name, in his name. But somehow, we get a little confused. We get confused. We get confused. So, you know, I don't know. Is this sickness from God? No more confusion. No more confusion. If it's good, it's from God. If it's bad, it's from the devil. You know, when we start to confuse good for evil and evil for good, we're, we're messing up big time. When we start to give God credit for what the devil is doing, that is like the worst false advertising we can do for the kingdom, the worst false advertising we can do for Jesus. Okay? He has given us power. He has given us resurrection power because he wants us to be doing this stuff. He wants us to take and step in into, his, into the power that he has given us. Acts 10.38 says, you know Jesus of Nazareth. God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. This is you. I know you. I know you. I know you. God knows you. He's given you his spirit. Why? Because he wants you to go around healing those who have been oppressed by the devil. Because the because God is with you. He has given you power and authority. He has given you power and authority. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Man, we got to stop. You know, when you hear somebody giving God credit for something the devil's doing, you just make, you know what, God is good all the time. You know, feel free to bring gentle correction in those situations, you know, just feel free, feel free. I mean, if you're in a church and, you know, somebody's preaching a message like that, don't stand up and like shout them down or anything, but, you know, but, but you know, feel free to, to visit with the person afterwards and be like, man, uh, where did you, you know, just quite, it's, it's okay for us to let God, let people know God is good, okay? We don't have to make apologies for God being good. We don't have to make apologies for having a victorious mindset and believing the gospel, like, this is what it's about. It's about believing the gospel. It's about believing the gospel. Jesus said, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We know that sickness, disease, poverty, all these things, depression, depression, oppression, that is not in heaven. We're supposed to pray that. When we pray, God, we don't, well, God, I don't know what your will is. No, God, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. That's his will. That's what he's given us. The authority, John 14 Verse 12, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. 
they will even do greater works than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. You ask for anything that in the name of Jesus that lines up with the new covenant. Like you can't pray, oh Lord, make this person sick. Ain't gonna happen, okay? <laughs> you gotta got line up with the will of God. You ask for it in the name of Jesus because that's where our power and authority comes. Devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You say, you know what? Devil, in the name of Jesus, I got authority over you. In the name of Jesus, I got authority over this situation. In the name of Jesus, I have authority in this situation. In the name of Jesus, I have authority over this problem. I have authority over this issue. I have authority over my house. I have authority in the name of Jesus based on this new covenant that I have entered into. By faith, I have authority. He has given me authority. He has given me delegated authority. Jesus said, Mark 16, 17, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents and they will drink any deadly poison and it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, just picking up serpents and, and, and drinking deadly poison, sometimes we don't like to read that verse because we're like, oh, I don't want anybody doing anything weird in my church and I don't want anything, I don't want anybody doing anything weird in my church. I'll tell you that. But, we remember when Paul got bit by the viper, he just shook it off his hand. There's a practical application for this. There's a, there's a practical application for this. Well, I remember one time I was on a mission trip, and me and this other guy, we drank something that we weren't supposed to drink. Oh, yeah. Everybody's like, did you just drink that? I'm like, uh, yeah. Oh. Everybody's like, oh, you're going to get really sick. And I just, I quoted this scripture. I said, no. I said, I can drink any deadly thing, and it will not harm me. And the other guy wasn't so sure. All of a sudden, he's like, oh, my tummy's starting to rumble. I got to go. You know? I said, no. I said, in the name of Jesus, you got the same verse. Like, we are not going to get sick. And we didn't. We didn't get sick. We didn't get sick. We just said, no. In the name of Jesus, it's not going to harm me. You know? But also, scorpions and serpents, those are, those are symbolic for the devil. Like, any, any, any devil you got authority over. You got authority over any devil. Luke 10, 19, he says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. All right? Nothing shall hurt you. I'm going to read this one more time. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Uh, this is literal, and it's spiritual. Serpents and scorpions... In, this, in the context of this, they had, this is when the 70 just came back, and they said, Jesus, even the demons listen to us in your name. And he's like, well, of course. This is the authority I've given you. Man, this is what I've given you. Of course they have. And you know what? Nothing is going to hurt you. Nothing is going to hurt you. And he said, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Not some, all the power of the enemy. All the power of the enemy. That's what Jesus has done for us. We have authority over all the power of the enemy in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter what it is. We made it real simple, right? We understand good God, bad devil. If you got bad stuff going on over here, you say, you know what? I got the power and authority over here. In the name of Jesus, I speak to this mountain and I tell it to get out of my way. You don't say, I speak to my mountain. You say, I speak to this mountain. And I tell it to get out of the way. In the name of Jesus, I proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And we thank God for what he is doing. We, in everything we give thanks. In everything we give thanks. And we stand on the promises of God. Just because he's given us a promise doesn't mean it automatically comes to pass. You know, it is his will that no one should perish, but that everyone should receive salvation. But that doesn't come to pass automatically. When Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, when he promised the Holy Spirit, he said, Terry in Jerusalem, don't go anywhere. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. Where were they when the Holy Spirit came? Were they at Walmart? They were praying in the upper room. They were gathered together, and they were praying in the name of Jesus, and they were thanking God for what he was about to do, and they were believing in the promise. They were standing firm in what God had promised them. Now, God has spoken promises over each one of you. Each one of you, has had, God has spoken promises over you. Some of them are very specific. And some of, them, some of us are just trying to wrap our heads around like, man, God doesn't want me to be poor. What? I thought I was supposed to be poor. 
What? You mean the sickness isn't from God? Okay, yes, that's all true. God doesn't want you to be poor. He doesn't want you to be sick. So if that's where you're at, you need to stand and say, oh, what? Jesus, Jesus died by, you know, he, by his stripes I am healed. I got to stand on this promise. And for the more specific things that you know, that you know that God has spoken something over your life, you are not to give up, okay? Don't give up. What would have happened if the guys in the upper room had been like, you know, we've been waiting for 12 days now. This is taking a long time. And I just heard J.C. penney has got a great sale going on, so I'm just going to scoot on out of here. I'll be back, maybe. Maybe I'll come back. I don't know. No, they stood on the promises, and they prevailed in prayer and declaration. They prevailed in prayer, and they said, you know, we're just going to keep praying. We're going to keep believing. We're going to keep declaring this truth. We're going to keep believing. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep declaring this truth. We're going to declare it. We're going to declare it. We're going to declare it. We're going to believe it. We're going to thank God for it. We're going to pray for it. We know it's coming. It just hasn't gotten here yet, but we know it's coming, and we're going to continue to believe it, and we're going to receive it when it shows up. And that's what God is saying to you today. Continue to believe it. Start to pray and thank him for it and pray and declare his will, and declare his goodness over your life, over your family, over this church and believe that it's going to happen. Just believe it's going to happen. In that first scripture I read, 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks to God in all circumstances. For this, actually, um, no, actually, Ephesians 6. For this is God's will in Christ. And, and this is what Paul says in Ephesians 6, verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. This is what I'm asking you to do today, okay? For the next 81 days, that'll put us right at the end of the year. The next 81 days, I want you to pray, okay? I'm not going to say pray for an hour every day. I'm not going to stop an hour. I just want you to pray, okay? I want you to pray for three things. I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to pray that Philemon's 1 6 happens in your life, that you begin to acknowledge every good thing that Christ has done in you, okay? Just pray that. Just pray. I want you to pray that. I want you to pray too. I want you to pray for your family, for your loved ones. I want you to pray that, that, that the promises of God happen, that the promises of God occur in your life. I want you to pray for your family and for your loved ones. Just declare the word of God over them. Declare the promises of God over them. Number three, I want you to pray for this church. Okay? I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray for this church. Ephesians 6, verse 19. Uh, so he says, with, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And in, in verse 19, he says, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me that, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador of chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I want you to pray for this church. I want, you to pray for the, I want you to pray for the pastors, and I want you to pray for the, the people that you know. But I'm specifically asking you, please pray for this church, and please pray for Melissa and I. Lift us up in prayer. Lift yourself up in prayer. Lift your family up in prayer. Lift this church up in prayer. And let's see the promises of God manifest in you, in your family, and in this church. Let's see the kingdom come. Let's see God's will be done for all of us in this room. When we say, looking back on today, and we look back 81 days from now, I want you to keep record of all the things. I want, when you see breakthrough happen, I want you to write it down. I want you to write it down. And we're going to have a time of testimony after the first of the year. We're going to say, man, I was praying for this, and it happened. Man, I was believing for this, and it happened. I stood on this promise. I hadn't seen it happen. I had given up hope. I had stopped praying. I had stopped declaring. But I started praying, and I started declaring. I started believing, and I started receiving. Because when you start to, to pray and declare and believe, you're going to start to receive some of the things that God has been trying to give you, and it wasn't the right timing on it, and you kind of gave up on it, but now is the right timing, but you're not looking for it anymore. You're going the other way, and God's like, man, take it. Take it. I got it for you. So today, pray yourself, your family, your church. Amen? All right. We're going to take a time of prayer right now. I want you guys, we're just going to take a time of prayer. I want you just to, today, I'm asking you to do something, so I want you to do it right now. <laughs> I'm not going to let you leave until you pray for those three things. All right? We're going to pray together. And then also, if you need, if you need an area of breakthrough in your life, if you need somebody to stand with you, if you need, some, if you need somebody to stand 
with you in faith. If you need an area of breakthrough in your life, if you need to see healing, if you need to see deliverance, if you need to see financial breakthrough, we want to pray with you today. We really, really want to pray with you today. We want to stand with you. We're going to believe for you. We're going to believe for you to receive it. We're going to we believe with you. We believe with you right now. We're going to stand on the word of God. So first, let's pray for those three things. Just pray, for, pray, and we'll just take, take two minutes. Like I said, I'm not asking you to pray for like 10 hours a day, but I'm asking you to pray every day for those three things and pray every day for those three things for the next 81 days. Every day for those three things for the next 81 days and, and see what God is going to do in your life. Just see. Just see what he's going to do in your life. Just see it. Just see it.